Good morning, Judge Jacob. Good morning, DCJ. I hope you're well. I'm very well, thank you. May we start? Yes. Okay. Uh, you studied music. I did. <laughs> and then after obtaining a whole degree in, in that line, you, you decided to pivot to law. Well, I got interested. I was trying to avoid um, following in footsteps, which is why I studied music, also because I love music. And then I, uh, I accompanied my father in the constitution drafting process and I got interested. And uh, it didn't let go after that. Well, it seems to have been a, an inspired decision because you did so well in your academic studies that you obtained, you, you passed your LLM summa cum laude? I did, yes. That was an international business, business law. law. Mm. Right. And then you started your legal career as a researcher. I did. Mm -hmm. As a law firm, then for the land claims court. Yes. To which you would return years later as a judge. Then you joined the Jobek Bar Yes, in 2003. Mm -hmm. And uh, remained there for, what, about 15 years? 15 years. Uh -huh. And during that time, you seem to have immersed yourself deeply in the business of the Bar Council and the GCB playing various roles there. I did because I still believe that the governance of the profession is so important to um, the transformation of the profession to making it accessible and also to providing legal services to the public. And you were also a member of the Advocates for Transformation oh, yes. and, and Nadell. And Nadell. So what kind of work did you do as an advocate? What kind of practice did you have? I, I had, I think about 70% of my work would have been constitutional and administrative law. Um, and the rest of it was a nice little mixed bag. It wasn't as varied as I would have liked, um, but it wasn't a complete specialization either. And you penned a couple of articles? Just a few. I, I focused more on the work. Mm. Yeah. So you we appointed as a permanent judge in 2019? With effect from uh, January 2020, uh, 2019. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes, you're right, sorry. All the years uh, mixed up in my mind. Yes, I was interviewed in o October 2018 and I was appointed with effect from the 1st of January 2019. Mm -hmm. And since your appointment, oh, you, you were seconded to the Land Claims Court as well? I was, yes and you have produced a number of judgments in both the High Court and the, the LCC. Yes. How many judgments would you say on estimate you have produced? Yeah, I, I did, didn't actually keep count, but when I realized that the question was being asked by this commission, I had a look, and I think it's somewhere between 250 and 300. Mm. You, you've been overturned in four on appeal? Four that I know of. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we don't get informed when we get overturned or, or upheld. Mm -hmm. So unless we come across it, um, or unless when we do the search we find it, it's very hard to know. Yeah. But then you've been upheld in another four, according to your, to your question. Yes. So it balances out. Yes. <laughs> Uh, have you acted at the land claims court, at the electoral court? I am currently acting um, in the electoral court, yes. Oh, since when? From the 1st of February this year. All right. Uh, you, you have had various things, well, you started out at the land claims court and you've had various things in that court as a judge. One would have expected you to, to have more interest there rather than in the electoral court. What, what, uh, why are you interested in, 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 the, in the electoral court? Um, I've always been interested in the electoral court. Um, in fact, I was tempted to apply um, to be a non-judge member, even when I was a member of the bar, but 
the timing was never quite right for me. Um, and I have always wished since the, this particular vacancy has been advertised a few times, I've always wished that I was in a position to apply for this court because I think that the electoral court serves a function that is very important because the elections are a cornerstone of our democracy and the electoral court is part of the, is there to serve the function of um, being part of the process of ensuring that the elections are what they are intended by the constitution to be. Um, and that's why I am interested in it. <laughs> mm. uh, in, in your short time in, in that court, have you had an opportunity to sit in any matters? I have. I've sat, well, I've, I've participated in three matters. One, I wrote the judgment, but we determined it on the papers in chambers. Which one was that? Um, the National Freedom Party matter. I, I, well, I'm, I'm subject to correction, but I scanned through your, your, your papers. You, you have not attached it, have you? Uh, no, because I've only acted in this court since February this year. And the application was in, uh, had to be in last year. And well, this, it is possible to supplement one's papers before the interview. I, I, I was not you, aware. You didn't know. No. All right, so can you just tell us a bit about that judgment? Um, that one was a challenge. Um, so the, the, the National Freedom Party, unfortunately, has been subject to a lot of um, leadership disputes in its short life. And um, before the previous 2019 election, there had been a, an agreement uh, which had been made in order of court, which allowed the two factions to, co to um, uh, contest that election. Then, um, unfortunately, they did not seem able to agree on um, their own internal leadership processes. And so the factions were accusing each other of not being the correct leadership. The IEC then, after and um, took the point that it would not took the position that it would not recognize anyone until the matter was determined by a court because it was before a court. Um, and then after that, there was a new election in that um, a party. The IEC then decided to, to acknowledge that, the product of that election as the proper authority of the party. And a person from the other faction then challenged that decision of the IEC. Um, so that's what that judgment dealt with. All right. And what, what was your finding? Um, the, the finding was that the challenge did not have um, any, any basis, um, primarily because the person um, did not have um, locus standi. They brought the application as the NFP, but it was clear that they were not, do they didn't have the force of either faction, um, but also because there was no merit in it. Um, it, it. It was a question of uh, um, what was the effect of an application for leave to appeal. They had appealed a, ju a judgment setting the, aside the election um, of that, that fa faction. Um, and they claimed that because they, had, they, were, they, they were appealing it, that it meant that they had to be recognized. But, we found that all that the noting of the appeal did was restore the status quo ante, which was where the IEC said, we're not going to recognize anyone until a court determines it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned two other cases. Can you tell us about those? The, sorry, I didn't hear. You mentioned two other cases. Two other you cases that I in. sat in. One was, um, I think it was two weeks ago, the, the application um, by the Democratic Alliance against uh, uh, the IEC to allow um, voting, international voting at consulates headed by honorary consuls. Um, and the other one was the one which was heard on Monday, which dealt with the inclusion of the former president mm -hmm. on a candidate list. Uh, I understand that only an order has been in both of those, um, the reasons have the not been provided because okay. we thought it was um, important 
we agreed on the order and we thought it was important to provide the order urgently um, um, because the reasons are not quite ready. Mm -hmm. well, I can tell you that the country is waiting with bated breath for those reasons. Yes. Uh, speaking about agency, the electoral court, as you would know, you, you would have experienced by now, is a high pressure court, especially it's, you know, during election periods, and you're expected to hand down your decisions super quickly. Now, I'm a bit worried by a declaration you yourself have made in your questionnaire that uh, you, you, you had uh, trouble delivering your judgments uh, timelessly. Have you managed to sort that out? I've sorted that out, and also the trouble was never with urgent judgments. Urgent judgments were always handed down urgently. Mm. It's the ones where I had to put them aside to think about them mm. um, that got me into trouble. But I have sorted out that. I've, I've, I've managed to um, figure out how one balances one's life as a judge in order to deal well, with Well, you that did workload. say that that was uh, during your early stages as a judge. So yes, you found your feet now. I have now found my feet, thank you. Okay. Um, you, you also disclosed a, a chronic health condition and I, I, I raised this as I did with, uh, with, 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 with the previous uh, candidate because wellness, is, is, uh, wellness in the judiciary is just not at, you know, given the, 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 the seriousness, it is actually neglected and we have seen that, uh, that there's serious consequences for judges and service delivery because judging is grueling work. And uh, if, if, if you have meagles, then that, that affects uh, your work performance. It certainly does, yeah. DCJ, and that was part of what I was trying to figure out um, when I was first appointed, um, how, mm -hmm. how to deal with all of that. I, I now exercise regularly, there, there are um, it, it, it's not, it's not um, negotiable. This is the time when I go for my walk. Mm -hmm. um, this is the time when I do those things so that I can function um, at my best mm -hmm. and deliver the best um, to um, whoever needs it. All right. Uh, all right, I'll hand over to Justice Zondi to put questions to you if there's any. Thank you very much, DCJ. Uh, hi, um, morning, Judge Good morning, Justice. You joined us in February 2000, this year. Yes. That, that is after you had indicated um, your interest in applying for the yes. vacant position. Yes. And I see that ever since you have participated in a number of matters that we had at the, at the electoral court, more especially those that are dealing with uh, nomination of candidates. Yes. And uh, the question that was put to you by the DCJ is why are you now entrusted in the electoral court? I see that uh, in your in your question at paginated page 12, um, paragraph 20, the last paragraph 20, you express the similar sentiment that you have always been particularly interested in the mechanics of how elections take place and how election disputes are adjudicated. So basically, the question reflects what you had stated in your question, is that correct? That's true, Justice Sonny. The, you, you completed the question on the 27th of November, 2023. And the NFP case judgment, when was it delivered, by the way? Um, it was, I think it was towards, it was in March sometime. Okay. Yeah. Right. So that was subsequent to yes. the completion of uh, your question. I see that we have also 
produce some papers which were published in a reputable publication, is that correct? Yes, but very few. Um, that's never been my, my focus and I don't pretend to be an academic person, unfortunately. Thank you. All right, I've got no further question. Thank you, DCJ. Thank Do you, you have any questions for the candidate co colleagues? Commissioner Glaber? Uh, thank you very much, uh, DCJ. Uh, good morning, Judge. So, uh, good morning, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, under what circumstances does a member of parliament cease to be eligible uh, to serve as a member? Cease to be eligible. Correct. Um, well, if if one of the one of the um, elements in Section Forty Seven of the Constitution comes to light, um, then uh, uh, they 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 can they they're no longer eligible. Um, for example, if they become um, an insolvent. Um, they become declared of unsound mind, they are convicted um, and sentenced to more than 12 months. Um, if they become the president, um, I, I, I can't think of more, more right now. For a councillor, I'm now taking you to a municipal level. Yes. Under what circumstances does an independent, a person who stood as an independent and won, uh, lose uh, his or her membership uh, uh, of council? Um, Commissioner, I would have to look in the Local Government Municipal Elections um, Act um, so I haven't looked at that particular thing. Um, I can look it up um, now if you wish, um, but I, I, I would imagine if it, uh, that, that similar provisions would provide, would, would apply, because if someone becomes declared of unsound mind while they are um, a sitting councillor, they presumably would also be um, become not eligible. But I will, I will, I will look that up in the act. Maybe I can spare her of that question. If you ask, uh, allow me, CJ, to ask another question. Yeah. It, I mean, just point out that it is not an open exam exercise. Uh, well, <laughs> CJ, it, sh it shouldn't be an exam at all, because when we're in court, we have access to our papers and to our legislation. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the textbook questions can really throw you off. I, I know. <laughs> you allow me, CJ, to ask another question. Thank you very much, CJ. Um, our constitution um, allocates uh, functions to different uh, spheres of government. Yes. National, provincial, and, and local. Um, which therefore means that uh, those um, the executives in those spheres are competent uh, to act in those um, functional um, areas. Yes. Um, for unallocated uh, functions, the residual uh, powers, who has the uh, power amongst the different or between the different uh, spheres? The residual um, powers belong in the national sphere. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's answered. DP person. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Good morning, Judge Jacob. Good morning, Deputy President. At paginated page 10 of your bundle under paragraph 16.3 and 16.4, you have listed four of your judgments overturned on appeal 
and four confirmed on appeal. And the proposition that I want to put to you is that from what you have provided us with, yours is a borderline case. Um, Deputy President, I don't think that the question can be whether you were always upheld on appeal or always um, um, set aside on appeal. Uh, the reason that the appeal process exists is specifically for this reason, um, that it's a safeguard, it's a safety net. A puny judge sits as a single judge and is only human and can make mistakes and must learn from those mistakes. Um, I certainly don't think it should be a balancing exercise of you were right in four of these and you were wrong in four of these, so it's a borderline case. I've written, I've, I've handed down many, many judgments most of them have not even gone on appeal. Um, so as, as far, I, I don't think it would be fair to, to use the words a borderline case at all. But there would be cause for concern if most of your judgments are upset on, on appeal. Um, Deputy President, I think it depends because if all my judgments are upset on appeal, yes, there would be cause for concern. Thank you. Um, but I, I don't think that the fact that there are judgments upset on appeal is in itself cause for concern, because otherwise we're saying there's no reason for the appeal process whatsoever. Just give me a moment, please. Let us just wait for the noise to abate. Where, where, where is it coming from? It's a train. We don't want the ceiling caving in on us suddenly. Oh, well, we can't switch the rain off. No. Should you continue, colleagues? Are you as hard of hearing as I am? Okay, let's let's continue. Just try to speak as, as loudly as we can. I will try, thank you. Okay. Thank you, DCJ. Commissioner Dodo? No. Oh, sorry, sorry, I thought you had finished. <laughs> Carry on, DPC. <laughs> Shall we then go to paginated page eight of your questionnaire? Yes, Deputy President. Paragraph 16.1, yes. the one that asks you to list the judgments that you consider significant. You have listed them, and the reason why you consider them to be significant. Yes. And from what appears from the questionnaire, uh, what you have recorded, that has left me none the wiser. I don't know why you regard those judgments as significant. I apologize, Deputy President. I put in what I thought was important about those judgments, and if that did not come through, then clearly I did not um, explain well enough. I'm quite happy to explain um, now, if, if, if you wish. No, you didn't even begin to deal with that issue and state why you consider them to be significant, what principle was propounded, what principle was explained, what principle was overturned, for example. Because well, for example, Deputy President, the last one, the principle that, that was established by the judgment is that when um, eviction in terms of the Prevention of Illegal um, Eviction Act is delayed by court processes and doesn't take place on the date determined by the court which granted the eviction order. A fresh date must be determined in terms of the act by the court and fresh notice must be given to the person who is being evicted um, that is the principle that is set in that judgment. 
and I'm sorry if I didn't explain it enough in my explanation. Thank you. Thank you, DCJ. Well, luckily for you, the General Council of the Bar has given us uh, snippets of, of some of your top judgments, and uh, they gave you a, a glowing report on those. So we, we, we are assured that you, you, you can produce good judgments. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Chief Justice. Commissioner Dodo. Uh, thank you once more. Uh, this is a good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. I want to, in the first instance, follow up the question that uh, DCJ posed to you regarding your reserve judgments and the length yes, of sir. delivering your judgments. Yes. At the moment, to be precise, how many outstanding uh, reserve judgments do you have? At, at the moment, three. Um, and all of them were reserved in the last couple of weeks. Okay. And, and, and for how long? Two or three weeks. No, I mean, for how long have they been reserved? Two or three weeks. The, the, from, from last term. Just, just a couple of weeks they've been reserved. I don't... Am I not answering the question? I don't hear this. this. Sorry, a few weeks. No, I mean the last time that you, I, I'm told because now I'm, I'm a novice here, legal novice, but I'm told that at least three months is acceptable yes. to deliver a judgment. Yes, and I, your reserve judgments have been reserved for how long? Oh, is that you four mean months, six months, a year? Currently or years? other ones? All of them All that of are them. reserved currently, that well, are outstanding. That are currently outstanding? Yes. Two or three weeks, I don't have anything over three months. You don't? No. Okay, thank you very much then. Uh, this is a, the next question. I want to ask you about the Electoral Act, which I consider to be the Bible of the Electoral Court, your, your court. Yes. Now, four years ago, the Concord made a declaration of invalidity so far as the Electoral Act is concerned pertaining to the participation of, of independents, independent candidates uh, to, to, to the elections. Yes. What are the features of this or what are the implications of this in your view in respect of the elections, especially these elections? that we are going to, to hold in the next six weeks. Uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. Uh, sorry, just before you, you, you answer, I'm really struggling to, to follow the proceedings. Can, you, can someone just tell them to switch off the air conditioner? We don't need it. I, I also didn't quite catch Just, just wait a bit, because yeah. I, want, I will also help you to rephrase the question. Thank you. Yes, OK. Well, I'm, I'm told it's centrally operated, so and someone has been phoned to switch it off. It may take a bit of time. Keep, let, let's chug along and just try to speak loudly. And I will also try my best to to be slow so that you hear me well. I, I mean, the the judgment of the Concord heralded a new epoch yes. in, in our country in terms of the elections yes. by introducing the independent candidates. Yes. Now, firstly, what else has been introduced as a result of, of the judgment of the Concord? What you know? Um, I, 
I'm sorry, Commissioner. I my mind's gone blank um, on on the on what's what's been introduced. Okay. Let me try to simplify it. I I was dealing with this matter for the last four years, and I'm the one who requested extension because of the complexity of the of the of the of the process itself at in Parliament. Yes. Uh, Advocate Nkretobi has talked about compensatory receipts. Yes. As a result of that. Yes. What do you understand with that? Compensatory receipts are, as I understand it, the, the seats um, that are allocated by the allocation of votes where, um, so each, each seat is worth so many votes. And if a person gets less votes than one seat or votes that are left over after the number of seats has been allocated, then in terms of the proportional representation system, those votes then get allocated um, to um, proportionally to the parties who have got the votes um, so that people get extra seats. And um, the Constitutional Court found um, that that part of the um, um, the act which doesn't really cater for independence um, still to be constitutional. We, yes, it's okay. The, the second part that we were declared invalid by the Concord was the issue of the political party funding. What do you yes. understand? What do you understand with, with regard to that? Because there are two areas, equitable uh, as well as the other one that I will tell you now, but what do you understand with regard to the political party, the formula for political party funding? Well, I understand that there's been a new bill passed recently which deals with political party funding and also funding for independence. Um, I have not looked at the bill. Um, and I know that there, um, there are provisions which provide for parties to um, get funding um, 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 according also to the proportions of their representation. But I don't, I haven't looked at the specifics and the mechanics of that. Um, and obviously if um, a, a matter comes which is within the, the jurisdiction of the court which deals with that, or to the High Court, then I would look at it and... Uh, no, it's okay. If you have not checked that, it's okay. I was going to follow up the question in respect of the equitability and proportionality. It, that is That must be taken care of. Okay. With that, thank you very much, TCJ. Commissioner Singh? No, thank you very much, uh, uh, TCJ, and good morning, Judge Jacob. Uh, Commissioner <coughs> Dodovo has made it easier for me in, in terms of the question uh, relating to the... Are you aware of the Electoral Matters Amendment Bill? I think you, you referred to it that was passed by yes. the two houses yes. uh, recently and not signed into law as yet by the President. Yes. Uh, and are you aware that uh, there are a number of NGOs, about 21 of them, and uh, 10 of the 13 political parties that have written to the president uh, asking him not to sign certain sections of the bill into law because some of them, some of the amendments that were proposed in the bill and passed by the two houses are substantive in nature and not consequential to the new nation judgment. Okay. Is there anything that you're aware of in that regard? I was not aware of that, no. No, then I... No, thank you, DCJ. No, she's not aware of the matters that I'm referring to, so I don't suppose I can take, take it any, any further. further. Yeah, thank you. Um, Commissioner Marumakai? Uh, thank you very much, uh, D DCJ. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, Professor. Um, I have one question for you, but before I, I do that, I just want to comment on, on, on this uh, being overturned on appeal and, and all those kind. Um, I think you should not feel bad <laughs> when, when you are overturned. I mean, if you have written close to 300 judgments and only eight are taken on appeal and only four is overturned, really, we... That, that is not a, 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 an issue that you should really be overly concerned about. And even so, the court that appeals, that overturns you, um, sometimes the judgment that are coming from there are, are shocking. So 
sometimes you find that even when they, they, they overturn, when you read their, their, their judgment. I mean, yesterday we, we dealt with one. Um, in the previous interviews, we dealt with Modau judgment, which was recently corrected by the Constitutional Court. Sometimes we just get shocking judgment. So I don't think it's something that you should be overly, overly concerned about. I, when I was preparing for, for, for these interviews, um, I got really confused with the legislative framework that is applicable in electoral, electoral law. Um, I saw in one legislation it says, oh, first and foremost, it appears as if the electoral, and correct me if I'm wrong, electoral court appears to be an appeal court. Um, it, it seems like it's an appeal court, you appeal to it. And I saw one of the provisions saying there's no review or appeal to the decision of, the, of, the, of that court. But I saw the constitutional court having to decide the matter is coming from that court. I just want to understand um, what will be the basis for an appeal to take place from that court to any court in South Africa, based on what I've done. And I just want to get clarity on, on that sort of framework, because I'm very confused as to how it, it operates. Y yes, yes, Professor. The, the Electoral Court has jurisdiction over electoral matters, um, but it's not exclusive jurisdiction, except for a few things which are um, specified in the three acts that govern it. Um, then, Jurisdiction is given to the other courts, the magistrates' courts and the high court, also to deal with electoral matters apart from the exclusive jurisdictions. Now, if you go to those courts, you can then appeal from those courts to the electoral court. The electoral court is only a court of final instance, as I understand it, when it deals with a dispute regarding um, the um, breaches of the electoral code. Otherwise, you can still appeal from the electoral court to the SCA or the constitutional court. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DCJ. Commissioner Steinberg. Uh, th th thank you. Uh, good morning, Judge Yakub. Morning, Commissioner. Um, I am sorry to uh, bang on about uh, the, the question of, of time it takes you to write judgments. But in this court, time is of the essence. So we do have to be satisfied that, uh, that the problem is solved. Um, you had mentioned, uh, you know, that there was a, a particular period uh, when you were struggling and, and that was, um, it was evident um, you know, it was that 2019, 2020 period. Um, however, when, when I look at the, uh, the GCB's uh, report, they say that at the time of writing their review, which was this year, yeah. um, there were still three outstanding judgments from two from August and one from November, which means that the August, no? I, I don't think so. Um, if, if I can just check. But yeah, you can carry on. I, I'm not sure which ones they I can are tell referring you. to. Thank you. So they say the Paleng v. Davy, which was reserved on 30 August 2023, Oh, yeah. sorry, that's, that's, uh, oh, yes, and then in Ray uh, Velvedin community, yeah, August 2023. Then there's one from November 2023. Certainly in the case of, of the first two, that would still be well over three months. Yes, that was over three months. Yeah. That, um, it was an appeal judgment. Um, and it needed a little bit more consideration. Um, and then with the Velfer Dent one, I actually made a mistake. I should have listed it under um, part heard matters because 
it was not actually ripe for a decision yet. Um, and in fact, I had um, received further submissions in that matter um, from one side um, two weeks ago, and I received an email this morning from the other side asking for an extension. So that one is actually um, a part heard matter, not an outstanding judgment. Um, when I put it on that list, I, I made a mistake that the matter was ripe for decision, but more submissions had to still come in. Um, your, I, I also see that there are uh, a number of judgments which were reserved late 2022, November 2022, that were only uh, delivered in July 2023. Uh, for example, um, S.O. Mujahi versus Minister of Police and Zubar uh, A. Haji versus Mohammed H. Darsot, for example. Th that again um, is, is, is after the period where you were, where you were having uh, trouble. Um, likewise, uh, Britain Joshua be the state. So, it, it, Joshua, Button Joshua versus the state. That judgment was actually given um, extempore in court. Ah. Then um, the, the there was an issue with the transcript. They requested the transcript very late. Um, and, and the other two that I mentioned that were in November 2022 and only delivered um, in July. I'm, I'm trying to. So what, what was the first one? Mojai. S.O. Mojai. Was that one of the, on, on which page do I find it? Uh, this is, this is uh, not in your, is it in, you said it was in the GCB? No, this is, this is just additional. Oh, okay, so that must have been one of the unlawful arrest ones that was in November 2022. Um, so 2020, yeah, it had a few issues that needed me to apply myself. And um, the, it was very, very busy. So I had, it had to wait. Um, I had to, um, in terms of juggling things, I had to prioritize things which were more urgent. And um, so that one did, I had to add it onto the pile. And so it had to take its turn. And the Haji v. Darsat? Um, if, if I can just check which one that is, we, we deal with so many matters, Ms. Steinberg, that I can't really remember everything by name because, um, yeah, there are just so many. Mm -hmm. If you give me a moment, I will check which one that is. Uh, you say it was in 2022. Yeah, you, you reserved on 23 November 2022 and handed down on 27 July 2023. Uh, sorry, my computer's taking a moment to respond to me. Uh, um, that's actually incorrect, Commissioner. The judgment was handed down on the 27th of, um, oh, sorry, yes, you're right, 27th of July. Um, it was the date I signed it. 
but the judgment was handed down on the 23rd of November. It was an extempore judgment and the transcript came to me late. So the judgment was actually handed down on the 23rd of November. It was heard on the 22nd of November and I handed the judgment down extempore on the next day. Okay, so it, it's really just the one that you said you'd put on the pile. Uh, yeah, and, and that's the problem is once you start putting things on the pile for consideration, um, you have to do them in order. And if you've got, um, yeah, and there, there isn't time in the High Court in Gauteng, there isn't time um, to, for, to, to fix a backlog until you have a break. And I didn't have a break until the second term last year. And when I did, I fixed the backlog. It's, it's a concern I raise because I, I, I really do appreciate the extraordinary pressure that the Gauteng the, the judges work under. Yes. And you know, I salute you all for, for doing it. Um, but all the judges are under the similar pressure Yes. And some meet the deadlines and some don't. And we, we, we just have to be sure in the case of the electoral court that, the, that, that these, the, the judgments have to come out fast and furiously. Um, or the, 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 the whole point. Yes, I just as well to, absolutely agree with you. And you're now confident that, that you're able to do that. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, such a, I just want to follow up on this line by Commissioner Steinberg. I think hopefully mine will be uh, less controversial, uh, Judge Jakub. Uh, it's because it's on the list you submitted, uh, page 10 of the bundle at item 16.5. Yes. Now, if you look at those judgments, there are eight of them uh, dating to the 20s. 4th of July 2023 to the 9th of November 2023. Yeah. And then if you look at page 12, that's the date you signed the form, which is the 27th of November yes. 2023. Now, does this mean as at the 27th of November 2023, those judgments were outstanding according yes. to those dates? Yes, that is correct. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, DCJ. Commissioner Nyambi. Um, thanks, DCJ. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, Commissioner. As a person that has acted in that division, if you can share with us immediate challenges that you have experienced that you think if you can be appointed, they need some immediate attention. Um. I think one of the challenges is the question of where the court sits, um, because we, do, we don't have, the court doesn't have, doesn't seem to have its own logistical, dedicated logistical support. Um, and I think that that could be a challenge, um, but perhaps it was only a challenge for the last, um, two hearings that we had because they took place during the recess of the High Court, but in the High Court building um, when a lot of people were on leave, so we had trouble with support. Um, I don't know that I've been there long enough yet to experience other challenges. Thanks. My last question. In your view, what is the significance of the Electoral Court in upholding democracy in our beloved South Africa? Um, well, the significance is that it's a special court which is dedicated to electoral matters and which has special rules which allow it to deal with matters quickly um, and to provide certainty as quickly as possible um, so that the elections can be free and fair and consistent with the Constitution. Um, it, it's, it's a safeguard 
to make sure that this can happen. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, TCJ. Commissioner Lutis, did you have your hand up? Okay. Mr. Mangan, that was, even, Commissioner Mangan. If, even if I have, I'm happy with the candidate. She's doing fine. <laughs> yeah. I see that Hena Dell membership all those years ago is working for her right now. <laughs> Commissioner Mangan. Thank you, DCJ. Um, good morning, um, Justice Jacob. Good morning, Commissioner. Yes. Um, you, you are aware that the the, election, the commission, the IEC, um, it's required by law to publish an election timetable. Yes. And that is for a particular reason. Yes. Because if that timetable is not followed, uh, elections may actually not take place, may just be delayed. Now, my understanding is that part of the function of the electoral court it's to enable the commission to have finality on disputes that would arise during the, elect the, during the electoral process. Yes. Now, you, you said that uh, you were part of the panel that said yesterday. On, on Monday. On yes. Monday, yeah, yes. and you, 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 you deemed it necessary to issue an order without reasons on a matter that um, it's by and large known to be very urgent because I've just checked on the election timetable. The IEC is required to issue certificates to candidates by the 12th. Yes. Uh, do you, now with retrospect, do you think that it was appropriate for the court to issue the order without reasons, knowing fully well that uh, whoever is aggrieved by the decision may need to weigh his or her options in terms of what the next course of, course of action would be. Well, um, Commissioner, the problem was that the matter was heard on Monday. It took the full day. Um, the judges, the, the panel conferenced and made a decision but the electoral timetable required the decision to be handed down by yesterday. So we had to give the decision. We did not have time to articulate the reasons um, and those will be done as soon as possible. Yeah, well, we do know that um, for an appeal lies against the order and not the reasons, fine and good. But, but for, for a litigant to decide what to do with the order, to appeal it or not, it is important for that litigant to understand what the reasons are. So there are instances when the order without reasons does not help. And this may just have been one such case, but I accept the explanation. Um, I, I want to believe that you, you wouldn't want to comment further other than what you have said. I can't comment further. Oh, can, okay. I, can I follow up? My, yes, bro? Mangan, I'm not sure whether you was done. No, no, with regard to this one, I was done. Um, I, have, I have a second and last one, which is not a very complicated issue. Can I finish it? Maybe let's exhaust your first one, then move on to your... To yes, my, my mind is more of a comment. I think um, uh, I would imagine that under the circumstances that we are dealing with and the period within which we are, we, we are at, it will be more prudent to issue out an order and make sure that the parties have certainty. Then the judges will, will deliberate on how then the reasons will come so that the process can, can, can move forward. I think the order cannot be delayed uh, because that's the most important thing. I, that, that, I'm not sure if you have comments on that. That but I was think... the motivation of the panel as well, um, in addition to complying with the electoral time date. Are you answering for the candidate, uh, Professor Marumacha? 
No, I'm, I'm, I'm just commenting on the deliberation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Proceed, Commissioner Mungen. Thank you, DCJ. Um, my, my second and last one. Um, it is my understanding that uh, the, the court also deals with um, irregularities that um, arises uh, on the election day. Yes. And um, it is a requirement uh, uh, for the elections that a voter should produce an identity document yes. to the presiding officer or uh, presiding or yeah presiding officer on the day of the elections. To your knowledge, does the IEC accept uh, electronic identification? I don't believe so. I, I believe that you have to produce your physical um, document, your either your card or your green barcode. Is that is that is that the position, or it's, that's what you think should be the position? No. Well, the last time I voted, that was the position, and I'm not aware that it has changed. Yes, but um, um, if if. It may well be that this matter has not arisen as an irregularity, but the same way that people le um, use their phones as a means of identification when they are at the airports or they're driving, wouldn't you think that the time may have come for the IEC to consider electronic form of identification? Well, it may have, but as far as I know, they have not. Okay. And of course, they would have to make sure that they're able to verify it properly. Um, and I'm, uh, I mean, I'm harking back now, the, the Constitutional Court um, before the second democratic election um, gave a judgment about why it was appropriate for um, the voters' role to be limited to those who had the green barcoded um, ID documents, because previously in the first election, you could use anything. Um, and they said it had to be because you could verify. And, you, and, and if you didn't have the barcode, it wasn't on the right system, and so on and so forth. So if they do update it, they're going to have to make sure that it's whatever new ways they use, it's going to have to be properly verifiable to avoid um, voter fraud and so on. Thank you, Justice. Thank you, DCJ. Commissioner McGuire. Thank you, uh, DCJ. Uh, good morning, Judge Jacob. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, three quick questions. The first one, how many times are parties allowed to replenish their lists per year? To replenish their list per year? I, I'm afraid I don't remember. Okay, thank you. Um, when is the term, in fact, uh, on what date will the current cohorts of members of the National Assembly cease to, to be members of the National Assembly? Um, the Constitution provides that the National Assembly ends the day before the elections, so it would be the 28th of May. The term ends on the 7th of May, but then the Constitution provides for them to be extended until the day before the elections are held. Thank you. Then the last one, um, once a person has been appointed Deputy President, does he or she cease to be a member of the National Assembly? I think it is only the President who ceases to be a member of the National Assembly. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions from the virtual platform? No, thank you. All right. Thank you. No, thank you. Okay. Do you have any questions for us? I have no questions. Thank you, DCJ. Well, in that case, uh, this is the end of your interview. Thanks so much for making yourself available. Thank you very much. And you're excused. Thank you.